Um, so, so um, now hopefully this is the right screen. So can somebody just tell me whether they can see uh, if I start the show? Can they see this? Can they see my? You're good. Yes, it's great. Around? Looks Fantastic. fine. Fantastic. So here we go. Right. <laughs> so return of the beaver. So I'm going to give you a talk tonight. Um, firstly, uh, about beavers, um, what they are, what they do, why we want them back, and then a bit about where we are with the Welsh Beaver Project. So, firstly, the um, just just a little bit of an introduction. Um, so, the Welsh Beaver Project is led by the North Wales Wildlife Trust. Um, it's led uh, on behalf of the um, five other wildlife trusts in Wales, including Wildlife Trusts Wales. So, it's an all Wales project. It's led by the North Wales Wildlife Trust. Um, uh, in partnership with the other wildlife trusts in Wales and our um, very uh, busy project officer Alicia Leo Dyke who some of you might have come across is actually based with the Radnorshire Wildlife Trust um, and we work uh, very closely with the Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust as well but um, primarily uh, um, it is uh, um, well, primarily it is done on behalf of all the all the trusts, and we're currently funded by the um, Welsh government um, with their European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development until the end of June, uh, twenty twenty three. So, firstly, a little bit about beavers. So, beavers are rodents, um, and they are actually the second largest rodents in the world. Um, and the largest in the Northern Hemisphere, the largest rodents in the world are the capybara, but they're a little bit bigger than beavers. Um, and there are two species of beavers. So you've got North American beavers and the Eurasian beaver. Um, and even though they are almost identical in every, um, um, in every way, including behavior, um, they uh, are not uh, capable of breeding because they are distinct species. Um, um, some two million years ago, I guess the North American beavers had some chromosomes that merged. So um, now they are separate species and hybridization is not possible. Um, and interestingly, we do have some uh, North American beavers in Europe um, where they are coexisting with Eurasian beavers. And uh, it's interesting uh, to see what will happen because they both basically occupy exactly the same niche. So one will oust the other in the end. And uh, I think I think there are some reports that the Eurasian beavers are outcompeting North American, and there's some reports that the North American beavers are outcompeting uh, the Eurasian beavers. But uh, time will tell, I guess. So how big is a beaver? Well, an adult beaver um, is usually around 25 kilos. That's sort of the size of a spaniel should we say, the weight of a spaniel. And um, they can get very large. So if ever any of you have seen Hank, our uh, stuffed beaver, which we use for engagement purposes, he must have been about 35 kilos because he's a particularly large beaver. Um, and they're about a meter, a meter in length and they've got a tail end of 35 centimeters. Females are slightly bigger than the males. And you can't really tell the differences between males and females at a distance. Um, I can't really tell the difference between them really close up, <laughs> in fact, either, um, because they keep everything quite well tucked away. Um, so you've got to get quite personal with them to find out what sex they are usually. So what do beavers eat? Well, beavers are strictly herbivorous. So many people think they eat fish, but they don't. Um, strictly herbivorous, and they'll eat pretty much anything that's green. Um, so uh, particularly in the summer, grass, herbs, um, uh, the leaves, um, the roots of water plants uh, make up you know, a large part of their diet, field crops if they can get them um, as well. Um, but um, it's, it's in the winter when these foods are often not available, particularly in more central European areas. Um, or northern European areas where there is snow on the ground for much of the winter, 
Um, that's when uh, they start to feed on bark. And that's why, of course, um, they will fell trees. It's to access the bark. And their preferred species is aspen. Um, interestingly, aspen seems to prosper from coppicing because um, if you cut down an aspen, a, a large aspen tree, or large-ish aspen tree, it, show, it throws up lots of suckers. You'll often see in uh, areas where there are beavers, um, where aspen trees have been um, um, taken down by a beaver, the floor is just littered with lots of young aspens coming up. And it's possible that there's a kind of symbiotic relationship that's developed there. Um, but if aspen isn't available, willow, they absolutely adore, and birch. Um, um, they will um, tackle um, other tree species, but things like alder have quite bitter tannins in the bark, possibly adapted uh, or evolved, should I say, as a, as, as a response to deter beaver um, attack. Um, because they're riverside trees, as we know, you're sort of associated with, with, with uh, wetlands. Um, and uh, they tend not to not to bother with conifers and they don't like the sticky bark, but they will fell conifers as a building material or presumably um, um, to provide space for broadleaves. Um, um, not that they're thinking this through. It's all it's all done by evolution and, and, and uh, behavior, um, evolved behavior. But but they will occasionally take down conifers, but they certainly won't feed in them and they're not a major. Uh, it's not a major issue um, to have conifers near a watercourse. Um, and they can digest the bark using bacteria in the gut. Um, and um, they will also often store beaver sticks under the water in the summer, or particularly they start collecting them mainly in the autumn, shall we say. Um, and they'll stay green and alive underwater so that it provides them with a food source in winter, which in climates as mild as Wales probably won't be much of an issue, but certainly in Northern Europe or Central Europe, it can be very important when there's not other food available. So beavers are crepuscular, which means that they're active dawn and dusk, and they live in family groups. In a natural situation, you usually have a pair of adults who will uh, stay together for life once they've met, um, and then you'll have two generations of offspring, um, and then when the next generation of offspring is born, um, the eldest are required to uh, flee the nest and go and find their own place to live. Um, in in um, um, captive uh, environments, you can often get m more than one or uh, more than two generations living together. Um, uh, if there's plenty of, of, of food available um, and um, you know, in, in, in there are circumstances where there are multiple generations of beavers living together, and the uh, the mating instincts of the of the youngsters, even if they they're sub adults or even adults, sometimes can be suppressed by the fact that they're still living with their, their parents. But in a natural situation, it's usually mum, dad, and then two sets of uh, generations of offspring. And a typical family size is three to five beavers. And they have very close social contacts and the whole family will defend their territories against other beavers. So they're known as central place foragers. So they have a central place where they live um, and they will forage in uh, around that site um, in, in um, uh, uh, foraging less and less the further away they go from their central place, shall we say. And uh, they mark out their territories using castoreum, which is a um, exuded from a scent gland at the base of the tail um, and their territory size is usually based on let's say habitat quality which is both food availability and um, other things they need like for example slow flowing water um, but a typical typical range is one to seven kilometers um, so that's an, av an average three kilometers of shoreline, either it's you know, three kilometers um, uh, in an average habitat. Now, this is a really important statistic here at the bottom of the screen. So 98% of activity, so 98% of beaver activity is within 20 meters of the water's edge. And in fact, 95% is within 
10 meters. So their activity is very, very closely related to water. They don't like to move away from water. Um, it's where they feel safe because they can basically dive into the water if they feel threatened. Um, and they move around far easily, far more easily in water than they do on land. Um, so this means that um, they don't readily spread from one river catchment to another. They'll certainly spread up and down a catchment very readily uh, and can do so quite quickly. But going from one catchment to another um, is something they don't readily do, especially if they've got to cross open or mountainous terrain. Usually, you know, it takes them a lot, long time and a lot of pressure for them to move from one catchment to another. So this was the probable distribution of the European beavers in uh, Europe after the last ice age. So this is essentially the, the natural distribution of beavers had man not interfered. As you can see, they didn't get to Ireland and some of the islands in the Mediterranean and presumably the southern, very southerly parts of the Mediterranean are just too hot and dry for them, uh, I would assume. But this was the distribution of beavers by the late 19th century. Um, so we have um, a small number of relic populations um, in what is now Norway, in uh, Belarus, uh, Germany, and France. And there were only around 1,200 left in the whole of Europe, which is quite astounding. And the reason is quite simple. We just hunted them. Um, we hunted and hunted and hunted them. And they're very, very easy animals, really, if you're a bit patient. They're very easy to hunt because uh, it's quite obvious usually where they're living due to the signs uh, that they leave behind and the fact that they have a lodge that's often quite visible. Um, and the reason they were hunted uh, was because of their pelts, which uh, were very dense and warm and allegedly, you know, worth the same value as perhaps a small car might be worth in today's money. So they're hugely valuable, these pelts. They're also relatively large animals um, with uh, good meat. And because, of course, they live in water and have scales on their tails, uh, they could be eaten during Lent because they could be classed as fish. Um, and uh, they also produce, as I mentioned, their sort of um, uh, territory marking scent castoreum. Um, and this was believed to have uh, medicinal, even magical qualities. There's possibly some truth in that because they eat a lot of willow. Uh, castoreum is um, often extremely high in salicylic acid, which is the precursor to aspirin. So, so um, it may well have been a sort of medieval painkiller um, and that then took on other more magical properties. So this was something else that was, that was keenly, so, keenly sought after and a reason for their, them being hunted. And this is a German woodcut showing uh, a beaver hunter with his dog hunting beavers. And it was wide, widely thought in medieval times um, that um, uh, castoreum glands were actually the testicles of beavers. And uh, the story at the time was that uh, if a beaver should hear a hunter coming to, to uh, hunt the beaver, it would um, bite off its own testicles and offer them to the hunter to spare its, to spare its life. Um, as, as, as amazing as that sounds, <laughs> I'm afraid it's not true at all. Um, but that's what this woodcut is showing. Yeah, I won't say my usual joke. Anyway, in case there are children watching. Um, so landscape change was generally unimportant. Um, um, it is uh, in most, well, certainly most of Britain, the, this landscape is still there for beavers because they don't actually need a whole load of it. They just need a fringe um, um, of habitat um, on the side of a river or you know, around a water body of some kind. So landscapes could change was generally unimportant uh, in their demise um, because it was hunting that did it. Um, and this just shows the other things that beavers were, beaver, beavers were used for. So all sorts of, all sorts of uses, 
for, for, for beaver fur, meat and their bones, including their tails, which could be hollowed out and made into a little purse to keep money in, which is quite macabre. Um, but they certainly were present in Wales, as far as we're aware, and the fossil record shows this. So um, in his journey through Wales, Gerald Cambrensis, Gerald of Wales, wrote, the Tyvee of all the rivers in Wales, and those in England, south of the Humber, is the only river where you can find beavers. In Scotland, or so they tell me, there is again only one stream where beavers live, and even there, they are exceedingly rare. Now, this was written in 1188. It may well have been secondhand information when it was written, and it may have been old information when it was written. Um, so even by 1188, uh, there weren't very many beavers in Britain, or certainly in Wales. Um, and I suspect they probably disappeared from Wales at some time, uh, probably before the 1400s. Uh, there are some who believe they survived in some places until the 1600s, and there's some evidence to suggest that, but uh, they've certainly gone now. So why would we want to bring them back? Well, there are a number of reasons. Um, so there's a sort of legal reason uh, the Berne Convention um, uh, and the Rio Convention, which were formally put into the EU Habitats Directive, obviously the EU Habitats Directive itself doesn't apply to us anymore, but the Berne Convention and Rio Convention do. Um, and these put an onus on states to reintroduce species that have been lost to those states. So beavers would count as one of those. Um, beavers um, also uh, can confer extremely good environmental benefits, um, particularly improving water quality and um, um, helping to regulate uh, the flow of water within catchments. And I'll talk more about this later on. Um, also, they're fantastic for biodiversity. Um, they are a keystone species in uh, wetland uh, and river habitats, um, helping to support a whole range of other species. And also there are socioeconomic benefits. So there's public interest in beavers. Um, they're a great thing to study for education. And wildlife tourism is of course, something that's becoming increasingly popular. And if properly exploited, beavers can bring in a lot of money into local economies. And there's also a public desire for species that's been gone for a long time. They're still quite familiar in people's minds. Um, and most people, want to see beavers reintroduced. Um, and there's also the moral argument, of course, that this is a species that was lost through the actions of humans, so we have a duty to bring them back. So what do beavers do? Well, beavers create and manage wetland ecosystems primarily, and by three main activities, feeding, building, and digging. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these. So firstly, feeding. Well, as I said, beavers eat almost anything that's green, um, but they will take down trees, as we know, and lots of people fear that riversides will be devastated because uh, all the trees will disappear. But of course, most of the trees that the beavers take down don't die, they just coppice. And so here you can see um, a tree that's been taken down by a beaver, uh, and it's, it's recoppicing. Um, and the tree on the right-hand side of this picture is um, a, a birch that's been locked at one point by, by the beavers, um, and that's you know grown back perfectly well. You might notice that the tree on the right-hand side um, has been felled maybe a, a metre and a half above the ground. That's not because the beavers climbed the tree, it's because the snow was lying that deep, you know, about a metre deep um, uh, on the ground when the beaver came along to fell the tree. It's, it's a photo from Norway. Um, and so these um, coppiced trees that the beavers create, one, they're a lot more stable on the riverbank. They don't get blown over by the wind, ripping the riverbank out because of course, coppiced stems will just sway in the wind. Um, and it also helps to open up the canopy to light, which allows ground flora to flourish, which provides um, um, plants and flowers for insects, um, which provide food for birds and bats. And so the whole, the whole ecology can spring to life as a result of uh, beaver uh, foraging um, on the water's edge. 
And, and this shows a sort of scene, uh, the typical scene of, of beaver foraging. This is taken from um, sort of semi-wetland site in Norway. Uh, and this is birch that's been coppiced. Um, and uh, you can see all the telltale signs of beaver chips, beaver wood chips left lying around. And these trees are mostly about 10 centimeters or less in diameter, which is the favorite size that beavers will, will, will go after. They can take down big trees, you know, up to a meter, sometimes more than a meter in diameter. But um, usually the trees that they want are about 10 centimeters less uh, in diameter because they're just easier to, to, to fell and to eat. Um, but you know, the fall a few seasons later, these trees still alive and they just coppiced, creating this lovely sort of coppiced um, habitat, which of course certain species like dormice, dormice um, and lots of bird species really rely on and really like. Um, and it may well be that uh, you know there are lots of species that actually adapted to living in uh, beaver managed ecosystems in a way in the past, you know, before we started to coppice trees and coppice woodlands. Uh, it may be that beavers were doing this for those species, such as, you know, dormice. Um, and the other thing beavers do by felling these trees is they produce lots of dead wood. And dead wood is an extremely important component of uh, woodlands, all woodlands, um, not just riparian woodlands. Um, and you can see here that the tree stems have been felled. Those are beaver teeth marks. So the beavers have stripped the bark. And now it's leaving this wood to rot and provide um, a habitat for dead wood invertebrates and therefore all the things that feed on dead wood invertebrates, um, as well as fungi. So it really does help to increase the amount of dead wood um, in the riparian woodland. And not only in the woodland, but also in the water. You know, these um, uh, two. Um, Leaflets were produced by the wildlife trusts um, on the importance of woody debris in rivers um, for uh, fish um, because it creates diversity of habitat. It, cre it provides the conditions for which uh, of, 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 on which um, uh, river plants can grow, on which therefore the river invertebrates can feed, providing food for the fish. Um, providing habitat for fish. Fish can also hide in the woody debris. So um, increasingly anglers are realizing the importance of deadwood in uh, river and stream habitats and beavers can add to this by their actions. Um, this shows a typical, often typical scene um, of, of young woodland where you've got lots of trees all growing very, very close together. Um, so they're all very skinny, all competing with each other for the light. And you can see on the ground, there's only really uh, moss and a few uh, uh, shade loving ferns growing in there. Um, and what the beavers have done is what we would normally do with chainsaws on, on lots of our sites. The beavers have gone in and they've, they've coppiced and felled a lot of these trees. You can see the stems lying around. Um, and what they've done is open up now the canopy to the light. So light is going to hit the forest floor and that light will enable other plants to flourish, um, other native woodland plants to flourish. And as I said, bringing the whole, the whole ecosystem to life. And that's the important thing beavers will do and they do it for free and they'll do it forever if we look after them. And it uh, means we don't have to do it with chainsaws, polluting the environment with our horrible uh, petrol uh, and, and CO2 that comes from it. Um, and this shows a river in uh, Bavaria. It's actually on the Danny Flood Plain. And beavers have been here for well over 30 years now. And you can see that there are still uh, big trees growing close to the river. These haven't been felled by the beavers. Most of them haven't. Some of them had been ring barked, providing um, um, Standing deadwood, which is extremely important for many species, such as bats, owls, uh, tree creepers, um, and of course, uh, invertebrates and fungi. Um, and uh, this site is actually uh, part of a broadleaf woodland plantation, commercial broadleaf woodland plantation in Bavaria. And we're going in a little bit now. So these are the trees we were just looking at. 
across here. And you can see that there has been some foraging going in here because about, you know, maybe 20, uh, 10, 20 meters in. Um, there does seem to be sort of coppice trees, uh, diversity of age structure. Um, and that's because the beavers have been foraging in the woodland. But the foresters here aren't, the foresters aren't at all worried about the impact of beavers because it's, it's just a, a very narrow fringe on the edge of the woodland. And so they're not bothered about it. Um, in Norway too, foresters don't bother insuring against beaver damage because it's negligible, because it's limited to such a narrow strip by the water's edge. So the other thing beavers do is build, and you all know about beavers building dams. Well, why do they build dams? Well, um, when beavers first colonize a catchment, they'll usually occupy all the places that don't need damming. So these are all the places that already have banks that they can burrow in, where the water is slow flowing, um, because they don't like water to be fast flowing, um, and there's food to eat. So all these areas tend to get colonized first by the uh, first wave of beavers that come in, but later as the population builds, of course, all these really good habitats that don't require any work are, are taken. So the younger beavers that have to go out and find their way in the world have to then live on more marginal areas where maybe the water isn't that deep, but they like to swim in, in water. They need the depth of water to, to provide them with protection. So that's why they build dams. So they would build a dam to achieve that depth of water that might not otherwise occur. And it slows the flow of the water. So they've got nice slow water to live on. It keeps the entrance to their lodge submerged so that it's a secret entrance, evasion against predators. It enables them to dive underneath the water so they can invade predators. They can, as I said, swim around on the water far more easily, um, including under the ice, although I don't think we're going to see too much of that in Wales. Um, and it's just easier for them to transport their materials around in water rather than on land. So that is why they build dams. And this is a dam um, on a small stream uh, photographed in Bavaria. As you can see, it's made of sticks um, and it's raised the water by possibly 30 centimetres, something like that. But that's enough and the beavers are perfectly happy with that. Um, this is another dam. This one, as, as I was saying about how beavers will sometimes fell conifers for construction. So this appears to be mostly made out of conifers. Um, but this is a beaver dam uh, on a, quite an upland stream in Norway. Um, it's probably approaching the limit of steepness that beavers can live on. They can't really live on streams that are steeper than um, around uh, two, two degree, two, two percent. Um, but by building this dam, the beavers have created this little pond behind them um because it's slowed the water down the leaky dams so water, water still flows through them and they usually have lots of side channels where water comes through so usually fish can can uh wriggle up either uh, and get through these dams um by these side flows um and these ponds are just fantastic for for wildlife like any garden pond that you've got like any wildlife pond these are brimming with invertebrates um, they're great nursery grounds for fish because the deeper water enables fish to um, evade predators and also they can hide within the dam matrix, matrix itself from predators. Um, and of course the invertebrates that are within these pools provide food because the, these ponds seed the whole river with, with, with invertebrates. Um, and they're also great uh, for giving the fish respite against the flow. So they don't have to constantly struggle against the flow. They can rest in here. And it's studies have shown that you get um, um, more fish and bigger fish um, on beavers or on rivers where there are beavers present. And of course, these ponds are also fantastic for things like water voles and great crested newts and frogs and toads and everything else that you'd associate with with uh, pond and wetland habitats. Um, and the other thing these, these habitats do is they, because they slow the water down, they can trap silt. Um, and uh, you can see uh, in this picture, you can see all the silt here that the, the, the dam has trapped. Um, and this, of course, cleans the water, um, which, you know, silt is, 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 can be a, a big problem covering 
for example, salmon spawning beds. Um, so what beavers do is create the situation where um, you get cleaner rivers, therefore more spawning grounds for, for many of the, the fish species that, that live on those rivers, among other species too. Um, and in fact, beavers do really good things for fish. So this is a study from Bavaria where they were monitoring fish diversity, a number of species of fish. Um, uh, so they've been doing various studies over the years. A beaver dam went in in 1990. 1995 and as you can see immediately after there was a, an impact because of the creation of the more habitat diversity the number of fish species present more than doubled and in fact one study from Germany again um, uh, showed that the abundance of fish also increases hugely um, and one study uh, discovered that there were 80 times that's eight zero 80 times more fish present uh, on uh, watercourses where beavers are present uh, compared to control sites where they weren't. So they really, really do great things for, for, for fish. And not just fish, of course, this shows um, how uh, other species such as um, birds um, will benefit from the habitats that beavers can create. So the, uh, in this diagram here, you can see this is the, the numbers before, uh, the beavers were there, this is when they were during, and even after the beavers have left the territory, uh, there's still a legacy. You get more of these species. And similarly, this is uh, uh, before, uh, before and during um, um, the abundance of damsel and dragonflies. Yeah, and you can say the same thing about most aquatic uh, invertebrates, because um, of course, dragons and damselflies spend most of their life underwater as a nymph. Um, um, so they're a good a good indicator for 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 uh, healthy uh, watercourses and uh, wetland. So I'm going to just show you some of the work that beavers do. So in this picture here, you can see a line of trees, and this line of trees actually marks a small stream, probably about a meter wide. But what the beavers did is they uh, dammed that uh, meter wide river and water would have started pouring out either side of their little dam, like here and here. Um, and so the beavers build a little bit more and a little bit more because the water goes on the side of that until in the end you get this, this little dam that goes all the way around here and this wonderful, wonderful pond brimming with wildlife. There were bullfrogs on this pond. Um, and you can see a lot of these trees have been coppiced at one time. So the beavers have nibbled them all at one point, but they've all regrown, they're all still there. If we go downstream a little bit, about 100 meters, there was another little pond um, and then, uh, created by, by a little dam. And we went downstream again, and there's another one. And what the beavers have done is turn this rather unremarkable small stream into a cascade of little beaver ponds brimming with wildlife and slowing the flow and cleaning the water. And um, uh, this is a habitat that we uh, have lost in Britain as a result of not having, having beavers. So when we reintroduce beavers, it's not just the species we're getting back, it's everything that surrounds them. It's a whole ecosystem that we're reintroducing. Um, and this just shows uh, a large beaver dam in Norway during spate conditions. As you can see, it's been completely overtopped by the water. Some people are worried that migratory fish can be prevented from swimming upstream by beaver dams. There's no evidence to show that that is true. And as you can see from this picture, uh, salmons, salmonids will have no problem jumping over that. Um, and some studies have been undertaken by Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, they had a, an enclosed beaver site. Um, I think it was started in 2013. Um, and uh, the beavers have now built, I think it's 13 little dams. Um, and what this shows is the rate of water going in uh, is faster than the rate of water going out because all these beaver dams are slowing the water, slowing the water down. So you can see this blue line here is the water going in. So even when it's really, even when rainfall is low, there's still flow coming out because this whole area is acted like a sponge. So in low conditions, it maintains water flow. And when you get really spatey conditions, really high rainfall, lots of water coming in, you don't get the same spike uh, of water going out. So it's slowing the flow, ameliorating flooding effects. 
downstream. So it slows the flow um, and maintains water during low flow conditions. And of course, it cleans the water. So this is a bottle of water taken from uh, above the site. And you can see the difference in color uh, when it comes out the other side. So really, really effective. If you, had, if you had lots of these beaver dams in the tributaries cleaning our water, we'd have much better quality water. They really are, you know, a silver bullet to uh, cleaning our, our, our rivers and lakes. Um, not the only thing we need to do, but certainly one of, the, one of the significant things we do need to do. And if they're slowing the flow, we'd have less incidents of downstream flooding. Um, and even if, even if all these beaver dams slow in the flow, only uh, you know, stops the water getting, uh, uh, um, if, if it only reduces the, the, the peak by a, a foot or so, you know, that can mean the difference between a property flooding or not. So, you know, it can be something that's uh, very, very uh, effective in the future uh, when we've got plenty of, uh, plenty of beavers on our rivers and streams holding back literally billions of gallons of billions of liters of flood water. Um, so the other thing beavers do is they um, dig and this shows the um, burrows uh, and lodges. So basically you've got your basic burrow which will be in the side of a, a river bank and then you've got your lodge which is made of sticks and mud usually on the side and then you've got sort of intermediate things in the middle. So here we see a, a, a kind of relatively large beaver lodge in Norway. Um, it's right by a main road. Um, and this is probably about two meters tall and it's made of sticks and mud and the beavers are living here and they'll have a secret underwater entrance where they can exit and enter the beaver lodge. This one, as you can see, has no mud on it. This is actually a beaver lodge from the Napdale site, which is the, um, the Scottish beaver trial site. Um, and it's a very rocky area where they were put. Um, and presumably there wasn't much mud around, so they didn't use much mud to make their, their lodge. And this is only about a meter, a meter tall, but again, they, they will have built a little underground uh, or underwater uh, entrance and exit. And of course, these uh, beaver lodges aren't just good for beavers, lots of species will utilize them. So otters will use disused uh, beaver lodges. Um, and if uh, otters are using beaver lodges, it means we don't have to create artificial beaver lodges, which is what we're doing here, because beavers will do it for us. Um, and also water voles will share uh, beaver lodges with the beavers, another sort of commensal species that, that will share, share, share the lodge. And another thing beavers do is create um, beaver canals, and they do this by both habitually going back and forth uh, from one place to another whilst foraging, but also they will literally excavate using their hands and beavers have almost got hands, not quite opposable thumbs, but not far off. They'll create these little beaver canals so that they can go across the, their, their territory far more uh, quickly and easily and safely than if they had to walk on land. And these of course are fantastic areas for species such as water vole, as I'm sure many of you can, can imagine. But it's not all plain sailing. So beavers can create problems. Um, so, for example, they can feed on crops if they're close to the water's edge. But because um, beavers don't go far from the water's edge, damage is very limited um, and mostly minor. And in most cases, uh, for example, in Bavaria, where the, this photo is taken from, the farmers really aren't worried about the impact that beavers have in their crops because it's just negligible. You know, the the um, maize uh, sweet corn has been taken here probably accounts to, you know, at most a euro's worth, maybe two euros worth. It's just negligible. They're not worried about that. Um, perhaps more of an issue is trees being felled that they don't want, people don't want felled. Um, there's no real habitat damage, but there can be an issue uh, with, with, with uh, the potential for trees falling on man-made structures such as uh, fences um, or, or, or power lines or something. But it's usually quite easy to figure out which are the problem trees um, because you can see where beaver habitat and any, let's say, for example, power lines intersect and take, uh, take action. So you can fence, you can put some chicken wire around the tree or 
other protection around the tree to prevent the beaver getting to it. You can use sand paint is another good uh, um, tactic, or you can do preemptive felling um, to prevent and take away the threat or just fence off a whole load of trees if possible. So it's quite simple solutions really to, 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 to that problem. Farmers, certainly in Bavaria, are more concerned about burrows collapsing and getting a tractor stuck in it, which can be you know, a pain when you have to bring up a neighbor to get your tractor taken out. Um, but this is certainly more of an issue on in areas like the flat Danube flood, floodplain, which is crisscrossed with lots of ditches, deep, deep soils. So it's sort of beaver heaven, really. Um, we're less likely to see this sort of uh, incident, I think, in Wales due to our both our farming and our topography. Um, uh, and also, you know, if we don't farm too close to the water's edge, uh, the problem in most cases goes away. Um, but the biggest problem in most cases is dams being built in the so-called wrong place. So here you can see a dam that's uh, blocked a small stream and now it's flooding out onto a farm track. But it's not difficult to deal with these dams. You can modify them um, or you can remove them if necessary, um, or you can even remove the beaver if, if, if uh, it's persistent. Um, but usually after you have moved the dam a number of times, the beavers give up and they, they know it's not a good place to build a dam and they'll find somewhere else to live. Um, and as I said, most of the reasons, uh, most of the areas where these occur um, uh, are just by the water's edge. And the, the problem is, is that we are basically using the landscape way too close to the water's edge. And if we could only provide and create these buffer strips, which we should be doing anyway, regardless of beavers. Um, if we had these buffer strips by watercourses, beavers would manage these perfectly for us for free and forever, and there'd be hardly any problems at all with, um, with, with, with uh, human infrastructure or land use. And a lot of the time, it's just understanding. So um, it's speaking to, to farmers about the, the issues so that they understand uh, the implications of beavers. And a lot of the time, after you've had a chat with them, they're not too worried. Um, but you can use things like electric fencing. Um, here you can see people removing a beaver dam. And this is a, a simple structure, you know, costs very, very small amounts of money. Um, and this is, this is stopping beavers blocking a culvert, just a simple bit of plastic pipe uh, and some metal caging. And we'd have a team, and we're already trained a team of volunteers um, to help do this uh, in, in, in uh, well, in the Dubby catchment, which is what, where we're focusing our efforts at the moment. Here you see what's known as a beaver deceiver. So if you stick uh, some culverts through the beaver dam, the beavers um, um, don't really know why the dam isn't, uh, they, you know, they don't understand uh, the, what's going on, so they don't try to interfere with the beaver deceiver. What you're doing is you're limiting the size of the pond behind the, the beaver dam. Uh, very simple to do. Um, here you've got some electric fencing put in just to prevent the beavers immediately building a dam downstream, but uh, they'll get used to it eventually. And at this site, it was in the middle of a village and the villagers wanted to keep the beavers, but there was a farmer about two fields upstream who was, was unhappy about some of his land getting flooded. So they installed in Bavaria this beaver deceiver and it just reduced the size of the pond behind the beaver dam so the flooding issue went away. Uh, you can, if necessary, you can put in uh, metal uh, structures into uh, uh, flood banks where that's where, where, where there is a potential problem with beavers tunneling into them. But in most cases, flood banks are too far away from the water's edge for them to be an issue. Um, and uh, rabbits and badgers are far more of an issue uh, with most, in most flood banks than beavers would ever be. Plus, it's not really an issue on most rivers in Wales. Um, and this just shows beavers. Uh, chicken wire around a tree to prevent it from beaver foraging. And this shows a beaver trap, which has been baited with apples, which beavers like very, very much. And if you know where a beaver has been foraging, because you can see where it's been feeding, and they usually habitually come back to this area night after night, it's quite easy to, to know where to set the traps. So there are many different solutions using simple, uh, sim simple methods, all summarized in this book, which is available from all good bookshops, funded partly by our project. And this shows a beaver that's been trapped. This is actually a, a juvenile beaver. Um, he'd been trapped uh, in Bavaria and he was on his way, luckily, to 
a reintroduction project in Eastern Europe. And beavers, as I mentioned before, can be very good for local economies. Um, and just to show, so this is people turning up for a beaver washing event at the Napdale uh, trial in Scotland, around about 2020, I think, 2021, this was taken. Um, if all of these people donated 10 pounds, that's you know quite a living for somebody. Um, and the Cairnburn Hotel, which was in the project area, increased their turnover by, I think, £30,000 um, as a result of having, having the beavers uh, present nearby. So they were certainly very, very keen for the beavers to, to stay um, and were sort of uh, uh, champion, championing the whole, the whole project all the way through. And the costs of beaver management uh, 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 it was uh, calculated by Wild Crew, Oxford University's Wild Crew, that the costs of beaver management uh, uh, are outweighed by the benefits by up to 100 times. So it makes economic sense to reintroduce beavers as well. So this is the current situation of beavers in Europe. As you can see, they have come back through both um, reintroduction by man and by natural spread to many of their former territories. Um, and uh, you'll see that uh, they're back in Scotland, they're back in Eng England. Um, we know that there's a small population on the Y, um, and now we have a small population on the Dovey. Nothing to do with our project. We haven't had a license to release beavers, so we haven't released beavers. But as I have been saying for many years, if we don't do it properly, somebody will. And somebody did. So there we are, that's the situation we're in now. So where are we with the beaver project? So we have been, working on this since 2005 um, and things really went into gear from about 2008 onwards and we did a lot of surveys and produced a lot of reports um, between 2008 and 2012. We did survey more or less the whole of Wales and we came up with these uh, six, the big six as we called them, of rivers that we wanted to you know, potentially investigate for reintroducing beavers on. Um, to cut a long story short, none of them made it through. Um, luckily, we surveyed a lot of other rivers too, um, and there's plenty of habitat available for beavers. So none of these uh, were current, uh, are currently being focused upon. Um, although we did for a while focus on the Raydoll, which is this river here, which runs into Aberystwyth, um, because there was uh, a lovely site that was managed by um, former Forestry Commission, now Natural Resources Wales. Um, it's a visitor centre called Bulknant to Ariane, and um, we thought it'd be a wonderful place to put a family of beavers where people can come and watch them um, because there is a cafe there and toilets and a viewing platform, lovely car park, fantastic site. And working closely with NRW at that point, the staff were really keen. And if you go there today, you'll see there's a wooden frieze on the wall with beavers depicted on it. But unfortunately, um, some people high up in NRW put the whole kibosh on the scheme which is a shame because we also had another place, uh, again, owned by former Forestry Commission land, owned by NRW now, where we were gonna have a wild release uh, where beavers could just get on and do what they do and we could monitor it as a sort of scientific uh, project. Um, both these sites were owned by NRW and I'm afraid at, at, at some point um, in 2015, it was decided that they didn't wanna go ahead with it. So we sort of had to start from scratch so we were looking at a site in South Wales, working with a landowner there who already had some beavers in an enclosure. Um, and we worked on that for two years, but he lost faith that he would ever get a license to release beavers and pulled out of the project and we couldn't persuade him. Couldn't persuade him otherwise. So that was another two years wasted. So now we're concentrating on the River Dovey, not least because uh, a few years ago, we learned that there were beavers living wild on the River Dovey, and uh, we knew there was one which had escaped from a, a nearby um, arbor, uh, um, um, a nearby uh, small zoo, um, um, but it was one male, and, and that had been living on the river since 2013. Um, but we had reports that uh, little ones were seen. Uh, some of the fishermen had reported it, um, and we've subsequently done surveys. Um, and so we know that we've got a breeding population of beavers on the Dovey now. So, um, yeah, so 
our main task, I guess, is, is trying to make sure that there is management occurring so that if the beavers cause any problems, there is a team available at a moment's notice to go and deal with those problems because that's the important thing is having beaver management in place. So that's been pretty much that consultation, uh, awareness raising and education has been the focus of our project. Um, but we do hope to undertake a release of beavers um, uh, into the wild uh, next year. Now we will need a license from NRW to do that. And the reason we need to do it is because these beavers have come from a very, very small founder population. So very soon they're going to be very in, inbred. And that's just not on in, um, IUCN guidelines, international standards. It would be frowned upon uh, very badly. Um, as they're now living in the wild, the Welsh Government has a duty under the Berne Convention to protect these beavers. So we are working uh, in discussions with the Welsh Government about how that could happen. Um, and of course, beavers are now protected uh, in Scotland and in England, and there's a whole system, uh, a licensing system already in place in England for their management. And we would like to see that replicated in Wales, not least as we have rivers like the Wye and the Dee, um, uh, which, you know, flow from Wales into England and then back into Wales. So having, you know, we just need, we, we, we can't have them protected on one side of the river and not on the other. Um, and as I say, as uh, the Welsh Government, because of the Burn Convention, has a duty to protect these beavers. So that is our job at the moment, is making sure that all of that stuff happens. Um, but we have done a release of beavers, but this was into uh, an enclosure um, at Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust's at Cors Dovey site, which many of you might know because it's the home of the Dovey Osprey project. We can go and see uh, ospreys. Um, well, now uh, in the summer months, uh, you can also see uh, beavers. And we did some trials of beaver watches over this summer, just gone, and they seem to go very well um, for the most part. Um, uh, and this is now a hub for uh, beavers as well as for, os for, for, for ospreys. Um, and other wildlife. And we have uh, funded uh, cameras in the uh, enclosure, which uh, was built, I think, in 2021, or possibly 2020, I can't remember. Um, uh, so footage is now available of these, of these beavers, and you, know, you can watch them on YouTube. And uh, if you go to the centre as well, you'll see there's a lovely mural on the wall and video footage of the beavers. So um, in 2021, uh, Yolo uh, Williams very kindly uh, released um, uh, the mother and uh, one of the kits, um, sorry, the father and one of the kits. And then um, uh, a few weeks later, the mother was captured and she was united with her family. And they're all living very happily together. Um, and they've had another baby kit, a little black baby uh, kit, uh, like this one here, um, because. Barty, the male, is, is he's a, a black beaver. Um, so uh, we've had another one uh, born this year and he resembles his dad, which is absolutely lovely. And you can watch all this on YouTube and I do advise you to do that. But soon, hopefully, if things go well and if we can get, uh, get the um, license from NRW to do a uh, what would now be essentially a population reinforcement of beavers onto the Dovey. Um, with these management systems in place, um, we can get all the good things that beavers offer uh, and none of the bad. And we can look forward to biodiverse beaver landscapes. Thank you very much. And uh, if you want to um, follow us, uh, so if you, um, uh, our website, if you type welshbeaverproject.org into a search engine, you'll come to our website and you can join up to our newsletter on that. Um, and you can follow us by at Beaver of Ank or on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, um, if you just want to support in general the work of the North Wales Wildlife Trust, please uh, note down these uh, email addresses. Uh, we'd love to have you as members, um, just three pound a month. Um, um, and you can be volunteers if you're not able to spare cash. Um, 
and you can also donate to the Beaver Project directly via our website. So please do. Thank you very much. <laughs>